to one and all. Our gemstone for today's lesson will be this little beauty. Can you recognize it? Maybe not. You're newbies to gemology after all. Well, this is topaz, one of the more famous gemstones in America. And topaz, if you want more of this type of information when we are done with today's lecture, well, of course, go to Wikipedia. That's where I get a lot of my information. You can go to GIA or even another gemology trade website called AGTA. These are all good outside sources of information about gems in general, but also topaz. So this will be, I'm, I'm including this one as, oh, let's go, okay, Roman numeral one today is topaz. Capital A under topaz will be mineralogy and geologic source. The composition, of course, you don't need to memorize this, but it's just interesting in helping categorize. The composition of topaz is an aluminum silicate. It's Al2SiO4, and then it has either fluorine or water attached to it. We'll put a little two right here. And this helps us determine the geologic origin as well. You have to have some in place where there tends to be a lot of fluorine, which is somewhat rare. Crystallographically, we can see a beautiful euhedral example of topaz right here. And if we ignore the color and we just look at the crystal, what we end up seeing is this prismatic crystal topped with a pyramid with a flat base. In fact, the base is right down here. And this is a cleavage plane going through in this one direction perpendicular to the long axis. That's called a basal cleavage, and that's very important. Base soul. We'll spell it over here, I suppose. So the crystallography, the crystallography is orthorhombic, if you remember all your different crystal systems. And this means what we actually end up seeing are prismatic crystals, all right, prismatic crystals usually with a, with a pyramid top. All right, so well, let's even write pyramid. We can see it there in the picture. And then the outline of the crystal tends to be a kind of diamond. If you were just to see like the base, it's this diamond that then grows up in that direction. So then let's move on to some other, I guess, mineralogical properties. It is a hardness of eight, and it defines that on Mohs hardness scale. So that means, oh, this should be a great gemstone. And it is a very good gemstone, but there is an issue, and that's this basal cleavage. So but we're going to say, but a perfect basal cleavage actually weakens the crystal quite a, quite a lot. Oh, come on, spell cleavage correctly. Cleavage. In fact, we have to care for that basal cleavage when we're wearing it in jewelry and also when we're fastening it. It makes the gemstones fairly hard to polish. Our geologic source of topaz, so let's say sources, well, most of the geographic sources are in Brazil. That's the number one producer in an area called Oro Preto. And then also in Pakistan. This is where the world's number of topaz is coming from. And in both Brazil and Pakistan, our primary geologic source is pegmatites, right? These are the pockets of the last gasp of crystallization from a pegmatite where weird things, maybe like fluorine, get enriched. And then, and it tends to be like in these open cavities. They grow into open cavities and produce beautiful euhedral crystals. Yeah, and in fact, up here under crystals, let's say euhedral because usually we get euhedral growth. Of course, because it has a hardness of eight in regions where there are pegmatites and the rocks are eroding, the topaz will go into the alluvial river systems. And so then we can find um, placer deposits, placers. That's another place where we can find it. And then rarely, but also somewhat importantly, we can get hydrothermal veins. Certain hydrothermal veins will produce but the real important reason or, or source are pegmatites. What does topaz look like? Well, here's our classic color of topaz, kind of this, they call it cognac, named after like whiskey and brandy, or maybe not brandy, I don't even know what brandy looks like. But so we have a, let's go, B, B is color and optics. 
I'm gonna throw in a picture here so we can see some other colors of topaz as we're going through this. This is an image from GIA, and here's another image from GIA. In fact, let's just go ahead for copyright purposes, say that I got both of these images here from the Gemological Institute of America. The classic colors of va valuable um, topaz are here, ranging from orange to reds to pinks to purples. Most topazes are not this color. In fact, we're going to just say most are colorless. They're coming out of the ground clear as water. But we do have precious topaz. Precious topaz has a lot of colors as well. All right, this would be the color, this would be that not precious type, but it does have a use. Precious topaz is going to be yellows, to browns, that's what we think about most of the time, but then the most valuable colors are pink and red. These are the most rare, valuable colors of topaz. There's a special name for this kind of orangey red color. This orangey red color is called imperial topaz, and it's a very valuable gemstone when you have it. Imperial topaz. It used to be found in the Ural Mountains of Russia, and so it was given a name after the Russian Tsar. The reason for the colors, so let's say reasons for colors. Well, there can be two different reasons for colors. We can have trace elements. And then the other part that you can give, that can give color, of course, are these color centers. And sometimes they operate in concert, and sometimes they operate independently. So it's our trace elements that give us the more rare colors like our, and it's chrome, all right, I'm going to put it here, chrome. This gives us our pink, our reds, and our purples. That's the sought after stuff. And it's color centers that give us the more yellows and browns. Sometimes if you have both, if you have both, then you're going to get an orange color. And you can decide that orange is valuable, like it is here with Imperial Topaz, or with a little bit of heat treatment, you can get rid of the yellows and browns and have it turn out pink. In fact, that's one of the most important things to talk about when it comes to color is how common heat treatments are. So we're going to have number four here. It's going to be treatments are common. Because notice one color I didn't mention yet. Treatments are common. It's blue. All these beautiful shades of blue is what we associate with the color of topaz here in America. And none of these colors are natural. Every once in a while, in fact, in Texas, we have a type of topaz we'll talk about in a little bit. You can get this kind of really light sky blue color that can be natural, but almost none of it is natural on Earth. It's all irradiated. So what we're going to do is we're going to say this. Treatments are common. They are basically not recognizable when you do a heat treatment. So the heat treatments, these are indistinguishable. Gemologists can't even recognize, and what they do is they heat it to around, uh, I don't know, like 450 to 500 degrees C. That's not very hot. And what you can get is you can get the yellow to turn into um, pink, and that improves the value significantly. The second, and the way we get blue, we'll say blue is produced by irradiation. What does that mean? Well, it means we put the we put it in like in a nuclear reactor. And we hit it with this beam of electrons or gamma rays, and it turns it, it makes all these color centers produce in the in the stone, and the irradiation makes a brown color. And then what we have to do is we can't we have to leave the brown irradiated topazes in quarantine for like months to a year in order to make it not be. Uh, damaging to us, right? Radiation damage. And then what we'll do is we'll take the brown that has been irradiated and heat it, and that will produce the blue colors that are very common in the American market. Uh, the last thing about topaz to talk about is the refractive index. In terms of the sparkle and the dispersion, well, this is controlled by refractive index and dispersion. And you know what both of them are? They're both very low. Like for a precious gemstone, they're low values. They're higher than quartz, but this is like 1.6. The dispersion is 0.01. And so this means together that we have a fairly low sparkle and, um, and fire. We just, it, 
they don't shine super brightly, okay, these gemstones. Now, the kind of the last thing just to wrap up here with topaz this is a short lecture on topaz. We're going to go just to kind of culture. How does this, how does it matter to us in culture? Well, it's a very, it's a, it's a, what would we say? It's a commercial, it's a very popular commercial jewelry in the United States. And you can get it for low cost because irradiating the colorless material turns into this beautiful blue. So it's very accessible. And that's good for those of us born in November because it is November's birthstone. It is my birthstone. November birthstone. And, well, I don't know if you know, but it occurs in the Bible in a bad way. Lucifer, the second gemstone that God describes Lucifer, in, he says in Ezekiel 28, Lucifer, you were in Eden, in the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, right, before he turned into Satan. Well, number one that adorned him was ruby, red. And then you know what the second stone was? Topaz. Oh, boy. Lucifer adorned by topaz. Perhaps that's an indictment. Who knows? Yikes for those November birthstone people. And then the last thing I want to talk about since I live in Texas is that it is the gemstone of Texas. There aren't many places in the U.S. where we can find like beautiful high-grade topaz, but you can in Texas. Out in central Texas, there's a county called Mason County, and it's called Mason County Topaz. It is this like sky blue color maybe a little bit paler than that. There's also plenty of colorless material, or at least there used to be. You used to be able to go out into the creeks around this pluton where there were pegmatites and just feel in the water with your hands. And you could feel the heavier topaz because the specific gravity of topaz is 3.5 grams per centimeter cubed, which is much greater than quartz's of 2.65. So it could, you could just feel it with your hands underwater, and you could just fill up buckets of this topaz. Now it's incredibly rare to find, but there's a couple places where you can actually go out to Mason County and hunt for your very own topaz as a tourist. I've done that a number of occasions. I've found some. What's the last thing I want to say here? Oh, just geologically, why is it there? Well, or where to find it? Well, you can find it in pegmatites in the Katemsi Pluton or in the creeks and rivers that drain off of the Katemsi Pluton, which is the Llano River and associated creeks. Let me know if you ever go gem hunting there.